want to start out with just thanking you for all joining us. Um, thanks to our speakers, especially for being flexible and adjusting from an in-person meeting to this online platform with the circumstances. And we want to especially thank our sponsor, um, the North Central Region there. We will be put, putting these on the NDSU Extension Livestock page under the grazing management topic area. Um, Tuesday's webinar is already up there if you weren't able to join us for that one. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Kevin Sedovic, the Range Man Land Management Extension Specialist and the Interim Director of the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center in Streeter, North Dakota. And he's gonna be talking about the cover crop grazing research that is being conducted in the state. Well, thank you, Miranda. I do appreciate y'all coming on today. Um, hopefully we'll get a little bit out of this information and what we're gonna try and do is present research or some findings uh, that we've been looking at for about the last 12, 13 years now in terms of some cover crop work. And so, so we're gonna start out with a, a little bit more on the, on the basic questions that you see with grazing cover crops and that we've kind of come about with some of the research we've been doing and some of the work that's been done throughout the Northern Plains on cover crop grazing. Um, so the, one of the common questions we get is, um, what should I seed? What are my seed mix options and why should I seed specific plants within a cover crop mix? And I, we always tell producers, you know, base that seed mix on your soils. What's your production goals for those soils? And what are your planned uses uh, for that cover crop mix in terms of a livestock grazing scenario? Uh, and it will vary, your seed mix will vary based on what your planned use will be. Um, that planned use could be a full season cover crop, which really is your largest array of options in terms of picking and selecting species within the cover crop mix. Uh, traditionally, we've seen a lot of work done with dual cropping, and that's a, a, a crop or cover crop that follows either a cash crop or follows a hay crop. Uh, we've seen more of this last year following preventive planted acres. And then the third one really is that, is that fall seeding that's gonna be used in, uh, in, in the late fall time period or for early spring grazing. You know, so your mixtures are a lot of options and you need to look at some, what, what's available in those mixtures. And a good mix should include cool season plants, warm season plants, and look at competitiveness. There are certain species that do not compete very well uh, in a mix, but they do very well by themselves in a monoculture. And look at frost tolerance or frost sensitivity. If you're planning on grazing in the fall, into the early winter, uh, the, the, more, the least sensitive they are to frost, the better they are for an option in terms of retaining their quality and production for that late season grazing option. And so I kind of broke these up into different groups. And, and when you look at soil goals, um, there are some options where you're looking at trying to put in plants that are high fiber consumers. And these are plants that tend to be high in nitrogen, high in crude protein. They create a lot of microbial activity and tend to break down fiber quicker than those high fiber producers. All your brassicas will fall in this category, your turnips, your radishes, your canolas and beets, your legumes will fall in this category, no matter which one you're looking at, whether it's a pea, a soybean, a clover, um, they all, these are all our high fiber consumers. And even immature small grains at a time when they're, when, if they were senesce or were um, froze down in the, in the immature stage, will do some high fiber consumers because of the higher protein value. Your second big category are really high fiber producers these are for producers who are looking to try and build organic carbon in that soil profile. They're looking for plants that tend to have a lot of fiber and tend to be high in production. Um, your warm season crops are going to fall in this category. Your foxtail millets, your sorghums, your sudexes, pearl millet, and corn will fall in these categories. Tend to be very high fiber producers. Uh, once your small grains go to maturation, you get to the boot stage and seed set stage, they now become high fiber producers versus high fiber consumers uh, because they've shifted more of their growth into a fiber base versus a nitrogen base. The third category that's gotten a lot of press over the last few years is really the pollinator group. And you can work these pollinator mixes in with the other two mixes. What you're looking for in pollinators is trying to add more diversity in that mix to produce flowering plants. And really the best pollinator mixes will create flowering plants throughout the season versus a one-time bloom of flowers and then they're lost. And NRCS programs are very popular in adding this within their equip program uh, with the pollinators. So you can think about those broadleaf plants that create flowers and how they may fit in there. They may not have the, the forage value for livestock, but have a secondary value for ecosystem services. 
So most of you have looked at cover crops are always familiar with brassicas. Brassicas tend to be always in these mixes. Uh, for one, they tend to be cheap, they're easy to produce, and they're very popular because of that side. They're also very high in quality and forage base for livestock production. And it doesn't matter if it's a cow or a sheep, um, they, they fit a lot of different ruminants in terms of consumption. The most popular brassica that over the last really 15 years has been the purple top turnip. Um, it was accessible, easy to get, it was cheap. It's probably my least favorite of the brassicas only because it's probably the lowest producer among the brassica species in a mix. So in terms of forage production, you do give up some tonnage, at least above ground tonnage with the purple top. I'm a bigger fan of the hybrids. Uh, Paja, Winfred are two popular hybrid varieties of, of the turnips that are more productive. Uh, and, and I think also give you a little more benefit in terms of soil profile because they have more rooting systems that surround that bulb versus just a bulb. And you can look at kale and the Swedes. These are tend to be higher producing brassicas, but they really fit the full season cover crop mixes. Um, they're not typically recommended for that dual cropping system because they need a longer growing season to be productive. The purple top and the paja, the radishes, they fit in both full season as well as late season uh, mixes for, for cover crop grazing. The one that, that I struggle with the most with producers is the legumes. Uh, we like, we always talk about legumes. We talk about the benefits of legumes in a mix in terms of nitrogen uh, fixation. Um, but the legumes are gonna be your most costly addition to any cover crop mix. They also tend to be the least competitive in a mix in terms of most of your species. The cow pea in particular, the soybean, the forage soybean, don't compete well in a mix, but do very well by themselves. Um, I like the field pea, it tends to be my most productive, especially in a dual cropping system. Um, hairy vetch gets a lot of press. It can be very productive. It's one of those legumes though that, that can, can stick around for a couple of years. So you need to at least think about that one when you put in a mix. It also does have some toxicity issues with ruminants. And so we tried to minimize that as, as a smaller part of that mix. And then of course, sweet clover is one that gets some, some press because it's cheap. Um, I typically will only use sweet clover in that fall seeding mix because it's a biennial. And so when we look at the grazing options, I, I put this into three different categories for our producers to think about. Um, the one that we get, we get questions on is what, what's my options for early spring grazing uh, for turnout for those cows, especially if you have cows and calves you can put on for a high quality diet. And these really only fall into one category and that's a, a fall seeding. So if you know you want to spring graze a cover crop in 2021, you're going to be looking at seeding these in the fall of 2020. Um, the most popular winter cereal that's been out there is winter rye. Um, it is a cheaper seed. It's also, we know, the most reliable and overwintering in the Northern Plains. And so it has a lot of popularity because of that. I do like the, uh, the winter wheat and the spring and the winter triticales as some other options. We just don't have a lot of data on those two species in terms of winter hardiness in the Northern Plains, as well as uh, growth in the spring and palatability. We did plant these three, these three species in 2019 in a trial at Central Grasslands. We will look at the production aspects of these three different species, as well as livestock performance and cost. So the other big option is the full season cover crop mix, which really has the least amount of data out there on, on what to plant, what to expect for costs. Um, and so this is one that, that I think has a lot of a, a potential in looking at research for summer grazing options. And this will be your biggest option. You can look at a number of different brassicas in this mix. And this is where I would look at a kale and a swede because of the growing season you're gonna look at. You can put in one to two small grains. Um, your warm season grasses work well in this scenario. They give you lots of biomass and they give you the production and quality during that growing season. And of course, legumes do fit better in these kind of mixes because they got more of a growing season. The plant I don't have in here is also is a broadleaf. And, and so you'll see more broadleafs added in here, especially if you're looking at a pollinator. Um, you could bring in a, um, something like, like a sunflower or, or even a, um, trying to think of flax would work in this scenario, um, just to add some more flowering plants in there. And so this gives you your greatest option of what you can pick. And I like to pick mixes in this scenario that are going to need a lot of biomass, uh, lots of production, so I can get that soil carbon built up as well as feed for those livestock. And the last one, which is one that has probably more of the data on it, especially in North Dakota, is your late season cover crops or your dual, your dual cropping scenarios where you're planting a cover crop following a hay crop or a small grain crop. 
Um, these tend to be seeded in late July to mid-August. Um, some years, we just don't have the time sometimes. We're not harvesting till mid to late August, and then it gets a little bit touchy on, is it cost effective to put in a cover crop in those scenarios? Typically, I do not put a legume in this mix, but that's my preference. Doesn't mean it, it's your preference. Um, it's hard though to get the value of that legume in this mix with that short growing season. Um, although warm season grasses don't produce a lot of biomass in this scenario, it still gives you the fiber to help in terms of room and function for those livestock that are grazing that, that cover crop mix in the fall or early winter. And so that's kind of a group you're gonna look at uh, for a late season cover crop option. The other one I haven't talked about here, but we'll see in here is also is interseeding of crops. And so you may see the interseeding or the aerial seeding of cover crops in corn to give you a late season use uh, within that crop for the, for the, in a corn crop. And we're seeing more and more work done with relay crops and mixing the crops that we'll see some more data coming out probably over the next five years in this scenario. <clears throat> so the other question we get is, is what can I expect for forage production and what's the cost? As a producer, they're gonna wanna know what, am I, what should I plant? What can I expect for production? And if it's costly or not, and, and that, that cost will drive what they pick and what they don't pick. Um, it's one of those things that, that, that tends to be menial as a researcher, but for producers, it has a lot of value. So I'm gonna show you a series of a few slides here just to give you an idea of what we have for production. We've done trials at, at Streeter, we've done some trials up by Candu. There's been some work done in the state. And I just wanna show you, this kind of gives you a series of different groups of plants. These are annual grasses seeded in July. And you can look at the production on the second column, uh, seed cost per acre in the third column and seed cost per ton produced. And if you just look at the last column, um, your, your annual grasses in terms of warm seasons are gonna be your most cost effective uh, plants in that mix. And so when you look at a full season cover crop, you know, a millet and a sorghum sedan do well in terms of production. As you can see, we have 8,000 pounds in this trial for sorghum sedan. And that cost was at three bucks a ton or a little under 12 bucks an acre for that sorghum sedan. You get into the uh, small grains, which is in red colors here. Oats tends to be your cheapest small grain. Um, even in the, in the trials we did last year in 2019, uh, the forage oats still tend to be your cheapest options among the cereal grains. Doesn't mean you can't look at mixing an oat and a barley in that. Uh, barley tends to be more palatable, um, but it tends to be less productive and a little bit more costly. In this scenario here, our production actually was no difference for oats, barley, or triticale, and cost was really the driver of what you're gonna pick in this, in this option. You can look at legumes, and this is just four legumes we looked at. We looked at forage soybean, hairy vetch, field peas, and cow peas. When we did this trial, cow peas were extremely popular in cover crop mixes, um, but it's also very expensive. And this was seeded in July, and early to mid-July, so our production on some of these would be lower, as you can tell. Um, but the, what I wanna point out here is these will be your most expensive of your mixes. You can see your cost per acre, and you can see your seed cost per ton. You know, three to four bucks we saw in the last slide versus 17 bucks to 35 bucks uh, with your legumes. So, so look at your legumes and pick a legume that fits your desired needs and your outcomes and know your costs associated with that so you don't get carried away on a legume and kind of seed at a proper rate. And the last one just looks at different uh, annuals. This is, we just have a, a turnip, the Pajau turnip and the Purple Top turnip. We have two different cocktail mixes we looked at in this trial. Then you can see winter rye and winter triticale in blue. Um, you can see the produ production numbers here. But if you just look at seed cost per acre, uh, the turnips are popular because they are cheap. You're looking at six to seven bucks an acre at a full seeding rate, um, where the winter rye, winter triticale on the bottom tend to be your most expensive ones. And the rye tends to be cheapest, and which is why we still see a lot of rye being done. I do have two cover crop mixes here. One is with a legume, or both have legumes. Um, the first one has a millet, the second one has sorghum sedan uh, with a cow pea, and the first one is with hairy batch. And 11 bucks an acre is a really nice cost, a cheap cost for a cover crop mix, and produced about 1,800 pounds. And the cocktail mix two also produced about 1,800 pounds, but about twice the cost. And so you wanna look at those cost relationships in terms of production and what your goals are on those soils. When we look at the, uh, this is the, the last one I have in terms of production at Central Grasslands near Streeter. Uh, you can see the cost of a, of a straight warm season mix in terms of millet at about eight bucks an acre. Our turnips were just under seven bucks an acre. And our cocktail mix that we had, which was similar to the last one, was at 12 bucks an acre. Uh, they produced about 3,000 pounds 
you can see your warm chisel is going to give you more biomass, um, which is why it's a nice, nice mixture in these crops. So the last question we tend to get is nutritional value. So if I'm looking at costs, I'm looking at production, um, what can I expect in terms of, of, of the nutritional value for these lactating cows or dry cows, depending on when you're going to graze them? I only have two slides here, then we're going to finish this topic up. But I wanted to show you, this is a slide that, that looks at your warm season crops, uh, your first four are warm season crops. These are your brassicas, your next two. These are your legumes. And the last two are your winter rice and winter triticale. And you can see nutritional value. The brassicas and legumes will always give you a high quality feed, even late into the fall. Um, where the warm season crops, you will know that when you get into late season, you get your first frost, the quality of these warm seasons are going to become deficient or marginal. And so know that when you have a high warm season mix, that quality could be low later in the season. The beauty of the mix is with the brassicas is you have the quality there that can offset the low quality of the warm seasons. The beauty of the warm seasons is they add the fiber. So this is just acid detergent fiber. 30 is kind of my threshold in terms of rumen function. And so if you look at your warm seasons, we have good fiber function, good rumen function uh, versus the brassicas. And, the, and the, the winter cereals tend to be low in fiber, high in water, and can create the digestive upsets that we see in, in any of our ruminants. So a nice balanced mix will give you that quality as well as fiber in that, in that mixture to get you by on a nice, nice composition. I'm gonna end there and turn it over to uh, Erin Gogler to kind of follow up with some different trials that we've done and that she has for updates. So, and then we'll take questions at the end if that works. So Erin, and uh, while she's getting set up here, Erin is uh, one of our range research specialists at Central Grasslands REC. And so today Erin's gonna talk just a little bit more about the research that her and Kevin have been working on. And so Erin uh, took the economic and the soil impact side of things. So Erin, I will let you take over. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us through this online format and kind of working through us as, um, you know, we continue to figure out this situation. I'm actually glad that Mary was able to pair me up with Kevin um, because for me to talk about the economic and the soil impacts of cover crops, you know, it was really important to also consider that role of grazing and what that does in terms of, you know, those management options and also the influences um, on that landscape as well as the economics. So, um, just right off the bat, I think, you know, a lot of us um, that are joining us today, we might be producers that are solely involved with crop production. We might be producers that are raising livestock um, and don't have a lot of crop production in our system. But I think, you know, whatever background we're coming from, uh, talking about cover crops is a good opportunity to look at ways of managing our resources and potentially providing some positive impact to the soil health. So just kind of keep that in mind as we talk through um, the rest of our presentation and maybe consider different ways that you can utilize the resources that you have available to yourself. Um, maybe partnering up with some neighbors and consider some options that could help you manage that risk. Um, you know, I think as producers, we're used to dealing with all sorts of uncertainty whether it's just the daily um, fluctuations. You know, today we woke up and we had snow on the ground. A couple of days ago, it was a warm 50 degrees and we were taking advantage of that to get some work done. Um, as we look to manage those risks, cover crops, I think, offer us a lot of potential. And that's what I would like to talk through today. So at the time that um, we put together a study here in Streeter, there hadn't been a whole lot of work in the northern Great Plains. Um, there were studies across the nation that were looking at the potential to use those annual forages to extend that grazing season. And that's what we really wanted to focus on here at Streeter. Just to familiarize um, yourself with the study location, it should be highlighted there on your screen with a red arrow. We are um, in South Central North Dakota. A lot of people consider it to be part of the Prairie Pothole region. 
The study that we put together it occurred during 2012, 2013, and 2014. And so um, just to provide yourself with some background information, during those years, um, our average precipitation, it was about 14 and a half inches um, from April through September. So encompassing that whole growing season. This chart displays the moisture in two different seasons, spring being April through June, and then summer, which is um, highlighted as being July through September. And for the most part, there was variation, which is expected. Although I do want to point out that in the um, summer months of 2013, there was a bit more departure from normal. And um, just kind of file that in the back of your memory as I talk through some of the um, challenges with the project during that year. So the project that we put together at Streeter was really focused on evaluating that potential of annual forages to extend the grazing season. And in order to do that, we wanted to focus on things that we thought were practical from a producer's standpoint and could be really valuable to, to understanding what was going on within that system. Looking at herbage production, you know, we wanted to focus on the overall pounds of production per acre. The livestock performance that we monitored was focused on overall average daily gain, as well as the, just the general body condition of those animals. And then the economic efficiency, um, we looked at that in a lot of different ways, but for today's purpose, I wanted to show the numbers as it pertained to the overall dollars per head per day of costs, and then compare that to other, um, other options like maybe keeping those animals in the dry lot or what the cost would be in a native range system. The soil health factors that we focused on, we were trying to care characterize the physical as well as um, the biological and co chemical components and really look at what was going on within that system. So to kind of help you understand the project um, and the overall layout without getting too in depth, basically there was a single crop and a dual cropping system that were put into play. So in this study, the single crop, it was the annual forage cover crop. When that crop had been grazed by the animals, it then went into a fallow system. It was also um, put into a dual cropping system, which was the annual forage crop, followed up by a typical cash crop. And those annual forage crops were seeded in those um, cropping systems right about the same time. So we put that crop into the ground each year by about late July or early August at the latest. The grazing treatments that we put into play were full utilization, uh, basically a take half, leave half, or a 50% degree of disappearance, and then a no grazing scenario, and our control was a dry lot. Um, I should also mention um, that the animals that we grazed in these treatments at the station were mid-gestation, um, Angus crossbred beef heifers, and the actual grazing, it occurred from mid-October into late November or early December. So the actual forage mix that we used, um, and you can kind of, you know, see what we selected for based on what Kevin talked about in his presentation. We um, wanted to have a good mixture of both cool and warm season grasses, legumes, um, you know, to really build that diversity to also minimize risk that might occur due to some of those weather conditions that can be variable. And then um, putting together a mix that offered some quality grazing for those animals to be maintained on. And then again, increasing that potential for soil health benefits. For this trial, our overall average price uh, ranged from $15 to $18 an acre. And this was the mix that we used year in and year out. Although in, I think it was in 2014, um, we weren't able to get a hold of sorghum sedan grass. And so we did swap that out for a German millet. So I just wanna highlight some of the major results, starting off with herbage production. So what you can see here is the um, production, pounds of production per acre for both the single crop system and the dual crop. 
And um, looking at it between those two cropping systems, it's pretty obvious to see that the single crop um, produced a lot more biomass as compared to the dual crop. Um, looking at the dual crop system, we do see that in 2013, you know, our production was pretty limited. Again, um, I interpret that as being correlated with the moisture that was pretty limited. Um, when I looked at that a little bit more closely, basically as soon as we took the drill out, um, the rainfall cut off. And so it was purely a function of moisture to be able to get that second crop in place and to get some biomass out of it. I'll just be talking about the average daily gains today, but I will mention that um, you know overall the body condition of those animals was maintained and they did well on the system. Um, so looking at average daily gain, this chart here displays it in pounds of um, pounds gain per day for each year of the study. Looking at it in terms of the different grazing treatments, so blue is the full use grazing. Um, red is the 50% utilization, and then green is our dry lot, which was the control. So focusing on the years when the growing conditions were a bit more normal, so 2012 and 2014, what we see is that um, there was a significant difference between the full utilization treatment and the dry lot. However, when we look at it in 2013, um, you know, there was significant difference between both grazing treatments and the dry lot. And how I look at that is that, um, you know, I think in these scenarios, when we have those animals in that dry lot setting, we had a little bit more control over the rations that, were, that we were putting together for those animals. Uh, one thing that we didn't account for when we were grazing out on these cover crop treatments is that, um, you know, there is an energy expenditure happening. And um, we also, you know, we didn't closely monitor the forage quality, though knowing what we um, knew when we put that mix together, it was, you know, adequately serving their needs. Let's see, now um, moving into the economics. So what this is showing here is the costs associated with each year and each treatment um, in dollars per head per day. And then I also wanted to put up the numbers of actual stock density per acre because um, I felt like that kind of gives us a sense of how many animals we were actually able to put out there, which is closely tied to the, the dollars of that system. So the costs that were factored in, um, they included, you know, our seed, fertilizer, planting, combining, herbicide application, um, and we tried to use as much of the actual costs as we could. Um, land rent and a couple of other factors um, were just custom rate values from the Egg Statistics Service for this county. So looking at 2013, and again, that was the year when there was um, a pretty significant departure from uh, normal moisture. What we see is that essentially we didn't have enough um, herbage production out there to be able to stock those animals um, at a level where it was uh, an option that was more affordable. And so looking at those costs in 2013, you know, um, there was really nothing that could compete with our option in the dry lot. Focusing on um, 2012 and 2014, when conditions were a bit more normal, um, our full use grazing treatment offered uh, some, some competitive costs per head per day, even when looking at the cost of dry lot. Um, although in 2014, and Kevin might remember um, a little bit more on why 2014 was so much more affordable in the dry lot system, but, um, I, um, commodity, prices. commodity prices, I think, is what played a role um, in the overall cost of the dry lot in 2014. Um, I didn't put it up here, but I was going to also mention that, so um, the native range system, if we wanted to compare some of these treatment options to that, as well as the dry lot, in 2014, the average cost um, for a five-year average um, was right at a dollar five per head per day. 
Moving into soil health, um, I wanted to highlight a couple of things here in terms of the physical structure. So aggregate stability is a measurement that basically refers to the ability of soil to disrupt or to resist disruption when something like a moisture event, a high wind event, when, when those forces are applied, the aggregate stability is, um, it's a measurement of that resistance. So we took these measurements um, at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study. In 2012, um, it, was, it worked out quite well because most of our numbers were um, right on par with each other, which gave us a great baseline for comparison. After we applied the treatments and taking those measurements at the end of the study in 2014, what we see is that in both grazing treatments, there was actually a significant difference occurring and that aggregate stability was increasing. Whereas in the no use treatments, there wasn't really a positive or a negative effect occurring. Now moving into bulk density. So bulk density is essentially a measurement of the overall dry weight of soil that's within a volume um, container, and it is an indicator of soil compaction. So relating it to aggregate stability, um, most practices that improve aggregate stability will likely um, show a decrease in overall bulk density. And uh, from a, you know, just a management standpoint, there's a number of different things that we can try and do to um, promote or maintain some of that soil structure. So looking at things like maybe trying to reduce the number of trips that are made up and down that field, um, looking at either mixes or practices that will maintain or increase some of that organic matter, um, just really minimizing the overall soil disturbance. So maybe selecting for min minimum tillage if the option is there, those sorts of things. Looking at it uh, over time from 2012 to 2014, we took our measurements at zero to three and five to eight centimeters. And while there wasn't a statistical difference that occurred, the overall trend um, was decreasing, which was something that we liked seeing. You know, if given the opportunity to stretch this out a few more years, I would have been curious to see how that would have impacted our results. So in general, overall management implications and takeaway points, um, essentially in this project, our greatest potential for putting a practice on the ground that would be cost effective was the full use grazing treatment in a dual cropping system. This essentially um, occurred because of a function of moisture and you know folks are listening from all over the state as well as outside of North Dakota and I think it's really important to consider where you're located, what um, your climate conditions are like, and focus on the overall goal of that cover crop. You know, it might be a better option for you to consider something that would be more full season or looking at maybe planting a winter cereal, grazing or haying that off in the spring and then moving into um, some other cropping rotation. But really consider the role of moisture and, um, and, and what you know, what that does for the system where you're located. The, um, I guess the big takeaway I had from the livestock performance aspect is I think it's, I think it's really important to consider what animals that you're gonna be grazing in these units. Are they animals that are going to be brought back into your herd? Are they, you know, what is the expected performance basically? Um, are you just looking to, um, keep them around a little bit longer before you take them to the sale barn. You know, what's the expected performance? And I think that's a driver for uh, how we choose to manage the livestock on that system or you know, what system we actually put them into. So um, going back to the overall goals of the operation, um, keep those factors in play. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you don't have livestock, maybe consider working with neighbors or different you know, different options. Um, and with that, I think, I think we're open for questions. So I'll have Kevin come back around and can stop, should I stop sharing?
Well, Kevin's coming in back around. We do have a couple questions for you guys that we're going to launch as a survey. So I will do that right now. And I will start priming the pump here for some questions. So. And don't worry, these questions are anonymous. So we don't know who, it, who you are and who, what your answers are. So don't be worried about that as you fill out or complete the poll questions. Do you want us to scroll through or what's the best? I, I can actually um, ask them, ask you if, if that's okay with you. Sure, yeah. Okay. So uh, one of the first questions we had was, is there any concerns with the sorghum sedan uh, grass causing cyanide to be released when grazing the cattle? I believe this happens probably after a frost was the question. That's a great question. And, and we get that question every year when we put sorghum sedan grass in a mix. Um, but in reality, that sorghum sedan grass, once it gets to be about 18 inches tall to two feet tall, your risk of, of cyanide poisoning is extremely low to none. Um, also within a mix, the one thing you'll find when you have a warm season, cool season mix is the cows tend to select the cool seasons uh, over the warm seasons, even though they may eat the warm seasons, is not at a very high rate compared to the cool seasons. In the trials that we've done, we've never seen a problem with cyanide toxicity or HCN uh, due to the sorghum sedan. And so it, it, my response would be, if you are feeding a cover crop field that is extremely high in sorghum sedan in the mix, then I would be concerned if it's in the immature stage of two feet or less. Awesome. And then there was a question, um, Aaron, um, what were you feeding the dry lot animals? Do you know what their diet consisted of? Not right off the bat. Um, I could put that, I, I could pull that information though and provide that. I don't know if there's a way to send that out. Do you know, Mary? Okay. Yeah. And yep. And you can even just send it to me and I can let the, the person know or, um, okay. yep. Okay. Yep. I, and I can give you a general what the mix was. It was a corn silage, barley, corn, uh, mixed with some hay. Okay. And but I think that was. Maybe. Okay, a couple, um, I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds on the poll before closing it. So if, if you have an answer, please take some time to do that. Um, of what were they eating versus the other. Oh, did you have any issues with salt? Oh. Did you have any issues with sulfates or nitrates in, the, in your brassicas? Did you look at cost per pound gain? So the question on brassicas, um, and, and that is an issue on nitrate toxicity in stands of brassicas that have been stressed through drought. We have not seen it in non-stress scenarios. Um, so if, if it is a droughty scenario and your brassicas are high in the mix, then I would test those for nitrate toxicity levels. Um, in terms of cost per, per what's the cost on the brassicas? Um, the question was, is, did you cost per, cost per pound gain? Oh, we did not calculate that number even although we could. And then following that up is how long were you grazing? So um, I do, let me grab those numbers here, but in general, it was from early October and in, into um, mid-October into early December, if, you know, if the biomass was there to graze. Um, I did see another question earlier that was asking to explain the single versus the double crop system again. Um, essentially the single crop, it was just the annual forage cover crop. Um, and the double crop was a cash crop that was um, followed up by that same annual forage cover crop. Okay, and then we have a question, Agar get stability. What do those numbers really mean again? Like 0.14 on the, on the full use treatment. Well, Aaron looks up the, um, the label on it. The biggest thing to, to take out of that is the higher the number, the better. <laughs> okay. 
and it tells you a function of size of heads. Uh, when you look at that soil and you break it up, the, those aggregates, the larger they are, the better you are in terms of creating, creating porosity um, within that soil profile. That's for water soluble. I'm gonna close the current poll soon. So if you haven't finished that one, please do. Um, and I will let's see another question. Let's see. Um, what are the problems with feeding hairy vetch? Can you compare hairy with common vetch? The problem with seeding hairy vetch? What are the problems with feeding hairy vetch? Oh, feeding hairy vetch. Yep. So, so with hairy vetch has the toxicity. And I'm going to let Jana cover this. I believe Jana Block's covering this topic uh, next week. And so I didn't look up the actual um, chemical within hairy vetch, but it is toxic at high levels and it takes a fair, lot, a fair amount of consumption, which is why we don't put hairy vetch in a pure stand uh, because of that potential toxicity level. So in a cover crop mix, in our case, it made up no more than 15% of our mix. We would not never have seen an issue in terms of toxicity, but that's a great question for Jana uh, for a follow-up session. And Jana will be talking about that on Tuesday. So I'm going to share that slide with aggregate stability again and explain that real quick. Um, so the index that I use for measuring aggregate stability, are you guys seeing that? Yes. Okay. So aggregate stability is, um, it, in general, those component like those components are measured in terms of millimeters. But um, the index that I used was measuring aggregate stability that is both um, accounting for uh, wet and dry um, conditions. And so that index, these numbers are applying that, that index rating, if that makes more sense. So this is correlated to a millimeter measurement. And just for reference, Aaron, um, Abby Wick put in the chat pod also, usually 0.14 means 14% aggregated. And then um, Leland asked, did, was the, the aggregate stability, was it determined by you or was it determined by a lab? It was collected in the field. You determined it. Yes, and then I calculated it. How do I stop sharing? Okay, so another question. Have you done much work with seeding cover crops into some poor performing uh, go back pastures to simulate growth? We, I have not, uh, but Dr. Ben Gumont out of the Hedinger REC has, and he published a paper actually about a year and a go, year and a half ago on seeding cover crops into what I call deteriorated uh, cr uh, grasslands. And he actually found a significant increase in production using the cover crop uh, versus not using the cover crop to help that help that plant community do better. I'm going to launch our next poll while Mary looks for another question for you. Um, our next poll is going to, is on the usefulness of this. So we really want this is the most important question to us to see, especially this platform. How, how you guys felt this was. And if you have any comments, please put the, them in the chat box or email them to us. And so we can kind of use that as we move forward with our programs and pro developing programs in this type of platform. Kevin, did you compare hairy vetch with common vetch? Did you no. answer that part of it? No, we've never done common vetch. And so that, that, I, I really don't know a whole lot about that compared to hairy vetch. Okay, make it bigger. Okay. One of the questions is Did the BMR sedan grass stand at harvest? And did you compare the feed value to non BMR sedan grass? Um, we actually did non BMR sedan grass the first year and went to the BMR for the last years of the trial because of the increase in palatability, redu redu reduction in lignin, um, and quality. The, and it did stand well in the stand throughout the whole season. So we didn't have any lodging or, or breakdown of it uh, during the fall or winter period. Okay. 
And then what percent of sorghum sudan would you consider a high percent in a cover crop mix as far as being worried about possible prussic acid poisoning? I have seen a hail event cause uh, this in early to mid summer when cattle were on it. Thanks. That's a great question. And you know, my rule of thumb, this is my rule of thumb, um, if sorghum sedan or sedan by itself makes up less than a third, so a third or less, I never worry about it. I've never tested it. We've done that for at least a half dozen years and I've never seen an issue. So that would be my threshold, but I'm, I'm basing it on my, my gut feeling. Um, we haven't done trials to look at different levels. And, and the biggest thing to remember is, is sorghum sedan or sedan grass that's over two feet tall and that doesn't not stressed will not have hardly any levels of of poison of prussic acid poisoning in that in that plant. And so the hail damage is a great question. If you have hail damage and you get a tremendous amount of regrowth on that crop, so your bottom is really is shorter, it's green and lush. Those are the fields that I would be concerned about for toxicity levels. A couple more seconds, and I'm going to close that poll if you haven't taken that already. Um, there's another question on, uh, oh, it's gone. Something about no use versus 50% or, or um, full use, which no use meant that there was no active grazing occurring, no cattle on that. It was just the grazing was not included in that, um, in that treatment. If there's other questions, you guys can keep sending them in. Um, if you did have any technical difficulty today joining, if you wanna just type that in the chat pod, that helps. Uh, we have one of our tech guys on helping us out today. And so that helps him to know what to look for next time, just in case there are any issues. Uh, there was a question last time about CEUs for um, certified crop advisors. And so you can actually just self-report them and I will drop the um, agenda into the chat pod here as soon as I am done. Um, the recording can be found um, here. This is our livestock extension grazing page. And so our recording is up from the first webinar and then this one will be um, up sometime either later today or tomorrow. Next webinar is Tuesday and presenters are gonna be myself. We're gonna talking about setting stocking rates and determine carrying capacity in a cover crop setting. And then as we already said, um, Jana Block will be talking about toxicity issues of cover crops.